do, Rick Flaggett, uh, take it away. Thank you, Ed. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, it really is a privilege to be here. I, I love giving these talks because dogs can't speak for themselves and a lot of people. How many of you have dogs at home? About half the, the residents of Colorado do, so you know the remarkable things your dog can do and sometimes the unremarkable. But the use of dogs in the military is, is something that a lot of people aren't familiar with and it goes back a long way and I'll talk about that. Let me just mention, um, if you're interested at the conclusion of the speech, I have a book that I helped a woman write. It's called Cracker, the Best Dog in Vietnam. And all the proceeds from this book go to the National War Dog Memorial in Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio. I don't make a dime on these, so if you are interested, please see me. I brought copies. The hardbound's $20, the softbound's $10, and I even have an autographed copy from Cindy Katahata, the author. And I also have medallions. We now have a state war dog monument down in Colorado Springs. And so I sell these for $5 and, and send the proceeds down there. Okay, without further ado, let's go ahead and get going here. In Vietnam, and I'm going to sit down if I may. Um, they were war dogs to us. They've kind of softened that now, and they call them military working dogs. But the use of dogs goes all the way back to the Civil War, and we know that because we've read the diaries of soldiers. And these, of course, were not dogs recruited by either the North or the South. They were farm dogs that followed their master into war, and a lot of them became messenger dogs. You may recognize the gentleman here as a young uh, I think captain at the time, George Armstrong Custer. I doubt his dog ever saw service. It probably was just a, a, a mascot for, for Custer. World War I, the U.S. did not do any recruitment of dogs. Other armies of the world, France, England, and Germany, had upwards of 20,000 dogs in their service. The U.S. had none. This was a French uh, dog team. The first U.S. dog had to be smuggled on a, on a troop ship bound for France. Uh, this is Stubby, a bull terrier, and I'm sure the guys just used him and thought, well, this would be fun to have him with us. Little did they know that Stubby would be involved in 17 major battles. Uh, he comforted the wounded. He alerted the enemy to gas attacks when he was walking the trench line there, so he became very valuable. At the end of the war, General Pershing honored the services of Stubby. Uh, and Stubby was brought back to the United States and lived the rest of his life. Uh, he died in, in uh, 1926, and his remains today are buried in the Smithsonian Institute. By the time World War II came around, we certainly did uh, understand the contributions of dogs. And the U.S. had upwards of 40,000 dogs that served in the various theaters of World War II. They used many different breeds. There, was, there wasn't too much effort to distinguish between breeds. They wanted, they wanted large dogs. <clears throat> uh, this is the first real war dog hero that was so recognized. This is Chips. Chips was a German shepherd. Um, he was responsible for saving the lives of many, many uh, U.S. soldiers. On one instance, uh, the U.S. soldiers were, were pinned down from a uh, machine gun nest, and Chips broke away from his handler and ran up the hill and jumped at the nest and, and scattered the enemy, and the U.S. was able to overtake it. But Chips had no respect for rank. You might see in this grainy picture of, of uh, of General Eisenhower, uh, right after this picture was taken, Ike leaned down to pet Chips on the head and Chips bit him in the hand. <laughs> Not a good thing to do to your future uh, president. <laughs> At the end of World War II, the dogs were sent home. And that's an important <laughs> part to remember because unfortunately that wasn't the situation in Vietnam. Korea had another thousand dogs that served in Korea. Again, many different breeds. You see Doberman Pinchers, and incidentally, I know we have some Marines in the audience here. When, when uh, we used uh, Doberman Pinchers in World War II, the enemy called them the Devil Dogs, and that name stuck for the Marines. So, 
In Vietnam, they focused on two breeds, Labrador Retrievers and German Shepherds. Um, and, and I think it says in the write-out, uh, in the write-up, I, I was drafted uh, out of graduate school and um, they wanted me to go officer candidate school because I had my college degree and I said, can I get out in two years? And they said, no. I said, well, I'm not interested. And they said, we're going to give you infantry. And that's what they did. That's the only time the Army ever was truthful with me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I thought, well, if I'm going to be in the infantry, I want somebody with me that's got a lot better senses than I do. And I applied for, for a dog handler course and was accepted. Uh, when I went down to Fort Gordon, Georgia, uh, I was a tracker dog handler. They used Labrador Retrievers to follow blood trails in Vietnam. If contact was made with the enemy and there was wounded involved, but they got away, they'd bring in a lab and the handler to follow up on the trail. Labs are, are uh, silent trackers. Uh, they used German Shepherds for everything else in Vietnam. I'll never forget the first thing that my uh, first sergeant told me when we went to training in, in uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. He said, if I ever see anybody mistreat their dogs, I will get them out of the service as quickly as I can. And, and we certainly uh, would not, would not uh, mistreat the dogs because they were, ju they were just wonderful and saved a lot of lives. The second thing that uh, Sergeant told me was, you're not asking the dog to do something. You're telling the dog to do something. And if the dog doesn't do it, there's ramifications in the form of more training for you and the dog. This is not a pet. The third thing the Sergeant told me is, you don't go up to another guy's dog and pet that dog any more than you would go up to another guy's wife and pet her. <laughs> and I've always remembered that. In Vietnam, uh, the military didn't do any breeding of their own dogs. All the dogs used were, were donated by private individuals. Now there's such a demand for dogs, the military is doing its own breeding of dogs. But people would attempt to, to donate dogs, and again, just focusing on labs and German shepherds in Vietnam, some 75% of the dogs that people tried to donate were sent back for various reasons. Either uh, they couldn't handle the gunfire, the simulated gunfire over the head, uh, bringing helicopters in, making sure they were going to be comfortable enough with that, or if they just couldn't, couldn't stand working with, in close proximity to other troops and other dogs, and they would be sent back. <clears throat> Uh, I, I mentioned it was very prestigious to be a dog handler. We knew that we were very fortunate to have somebody with us that, that had considerably better senses than we do, and I'll talk about those senses. To train the dogs, we use, and most of you recognize what this is, it just doesn't have a fuse or explosive, but this is what we would use, and we'd set a tripwire up over the, over the path. Well, the first time the dog goes up there, he doesn't know he's supposed to stop. He'd walk right through that tripwire, and of course, instead of an explosive grenade, we'd use a smoke grenade. And he didn't like the smell of that, which smelled like rotten eggs any more than we did. And it doesn't take them very long. They're awful smart. One of the reasons they use labs and German shepherds, they're very intelligent, and they're very quick learners. So the second time he comes up there, and he may hesitate, or he may go through again. And you keep working at it, and pretty soon, he, he knows it's there. Even if we can't see it, even if he can't see it, he can smell the scent of the enemy setting it up. He can smell the scent of the crust vegetation of the enemy putting it in. He can smell the explosive. He can hear the vibration of the tripwire in the wind. Whatever senses he used, he comes up and he says, I'm not going through that. And a lot of dogs, my dog in Vietnam, would sit down when he smelled a, a mechanical booby trap, which was a good thing because you don't want him moving around and then coming back and maybe hitting one that he, that he missed the first time. And the first time we would set them up, we would know where they were. So we look at how our dog reacts. After a while, they would hide them. And so we didn't know. So we had to rely entirely on the dog to detect these uh, booby traps, and, and they were all quick to do that. I mentioned they used German Shepherds for everything else. Sentry dogs, 
uh, mine and tunnel dogs, drug enforcement dogs, water patrol dogs. And sometimes they would start a dog in a training like for a scout dog, but his disposition was just so aggressive that they say, probably better suited to sentry dogs. Vietnam, as you know, was a helicopter war. Dogs had to be comfortable with the wind and the, and the noise from helicopters, and most of them just loved it. The ones that didn't, again, were, were sent back. But my dog, for example, and when we were out in the field, and typically we'd be out on a, about a week-long mission, and that day when the, when the uh, helicopters were coming in to pick us up, of course, for an infantryman, that's the greatest sound is that whop, 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 whop of those choppers coming in. Well, the dog would hear it before the, the soldiers would. And all of a sudden, my dog would jump up and he'd start wagging his tail and he's looking up in the air and the other soldiers are saying, what's, what's that dog? What's wrong with him? And then minutes later, he'd hear the choppers come in. So the guys started getting smart and they'd watch the dog. And when the dog jumped up and started wagging his tail, then the guys would jump up and wag their tails because <laughs> they know they're getting out. I never had to exit this way uh, with my dog. I, I did repel off of a, uh, uh, a rope from helicopters, but I didn't have to free jump like this. But you can probably figure this isn't the favorite activity for the dog. He's got his, he's got his claws out there, and he wants to get back down to earth. <clears throat> I visited um, a lab unit when I got to Vietnam, and uh, you can see we had uh, concrete slabs and then cover from the intense heat uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the, the kennel area. But they didn't give us resources to put the dog's name up, but you better believe that we found, we found wood that we could use because we were very proud of who our dog was. And, and Booga Bear's uh, owner here, he wanted to make sure everybody knew this was Booga Bear. <laughs> I'm a member of the Vietnam Dog Handler Association and we go to reunions periodically. The first time I went was in the year 2000 and I spoke to a lot of dog handlers and I haven't talked to any yet that would have traded his job as a handler for anything else we could have done in the military. Despite the inherent dangers of, of being a dog handler, when we had a team from Fort Benning, Georgia come out to Fort Polk, that's where I had my infantry training, and they said outside of helicopter pilots and snipers, dog handlers had the third highest mortality rate. Now, I'm not the sharpest tack in the rug here, but that didn't sound like a real good recruiting tool. <laughs> but I thought, well, again, I want somebody that's got a lot better senses than I do. And, and, and I signed up for that. And uh, I, I certainly don't regret it to this day. I mentioned using German Shepherds for water patrol, and I'm sorry about the grainy photograph here, but uh, this was the only one I could find. A lot of times the enemy would infiltrate the U.S. bases in Vietnam by swimming underneath and breathing out of a, a hollow tube, like a snorkel tube kind of thing. We couldn't detect the presence underneath the water, but the dogs could. They put the dogs in the front, and he's smelling as we're going along, and he would alert the handler to the presence of, of humans below. <clears throat> I was assigned uh, to the 48th Scout Dog Platoon, and uh, I was very, uh, very pleased that I was assigned to Big Boy. Big Boy was a German Shepherd, pretty sizable, similar to the prop that we have walking <laughs> around here. Um, but the important thing was Big Boy had been there four years. If a dog can survive four years as a scout dog in Vietnam, he's got to be pretty good. Scout dog's main job is to lead patrols in the field and smell out ambushes and booby traps. And so they're the first living being and the handler is the first human behind. That's the reason for the high casualty rate for the, for the handlers. <clears throat> Excuse me, was that you in the picture? Yeah, okay. that was a few years ago though. <laughs> um, you had to do basic obedience for the dogs, and it wasn't so much that the dogs needed the training, it was just to build that bond, that loyalty to exist between you and the dog, that that dog wants to work for you, and you have the confidence in that dog to do it. Again, uh, it, was, it was real nice for me to have an experienced dog. Because we had 10 different obstacles in our obstacle course area. The ladder, you see 
barrel jumps, we had a tunnel, we had a water hazard. Guys had to coax their dog, some of them, over each obstacle. I would open the, the door to the obstacle course and Big Boy would run around and do all 10 things and then come running back to me wagging his tail. Hey, that was fun, let's do that again. <laughs> to simulate what the dogs would experience in the bush, uh, we would pay the local South Vietnamese boys and girls to set up dummy booby traps that we would work on the dogs before we took them out for real. Uh, it was nice from, from the, uh, 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 the, the authentic standpoint, but it was risky because some dogs started to uh, detect the smell of the, of the Vietnamese, even the friendly Vietnamese, and figured they're all enemy. And so a lot of the guys that had aggressive dogs had to be very careful with the friendly South Vietnamese, our allies, when we were back in the rear. I was fortunate that Big Boy was very friendly. He liked everybody. And again, training with the dogs before you go out in the first, the first mission. Uh, and I know he's detected a booby trap here because he sits down. Talk a little bit about dog senses. Um, sight, pretty much of a wash. Uh, ours is probably even better for distance and for color than dogs. Dogs might be a little bit better in, in motion. Uh, but it's, it, there's not a big discernible difference between our abilities and dogs as far as sight. Um, hearing, I've heard anywhere from 20 to 40 times as acute as our hearing. They can hear that vibration of the tripwire and the wind. We certainly can't hear that. But it's their sense of smell that differentiates them from our abilities. If I was to tell you that a dog is capable of detecting one part per trillion, doesn't mean much to you because it's too big of a number to understand. When I, when I speak at schools, I say, think of having two side-by-side -side swimming pools and come in and add one drop of aromatic liquid to that one pool and mix it up and then bring a dog in. He's going to be able to tell you which pool had that, that drop added to it. We have between four and five million smell receptors in our nasal cavity. Four to five million sounds like a lot. That German Shepherd that's walking around here has about 220 million. They live in a different world than we do. They live in a world of scent. And that's why we're using them now for things like the detection of the growth of cancer cells because they're more accurate in machine, than machines in detecting the cancer growth. Their sense of smell is so acute. Even though scout dogs' job is to lead patrols, smell out ambushes and booby traps, they're sometimes assigned to other activities. Big Boy and I happen to be the closest dog team uh, to this area where a Huey had gotten shot down. Fortunately, nobody in the crew was killed. Everybody, everybody survived. But they brought this big Chinook helicopter in to hook up the Huey and take it back in to repair, and they brought Big Boy and I around for security, and we walked around as, as they got everything hooked up. Right after I took this picture, and the, and the, um, the Chinook took the Huey away, the last uh, Huey came to pick me up, but that was full. And I said, Rick, we got room for you, but don't have room for your dog. We'll leave the dog here, come back later, and pick him up. Well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> And I said, no, I will stay here. You bring another chopper out. And I know it, was, it wasn't more than 10 minutes, but I can tell you it was the longest 10 minutes of my life <laughs> because the enemy always knows where we are. We got helicopters flying around, and when we leave the area, they come in and they pick up all the ammunition and food and things that we threw out of our packs. And that's all I could think about is just me and Big Boy here, and here comes the, the Viet Cong and the NVA to the police up the area, but uh, better believe I was very happy when we're laying there in that buffalo grass and all of a sudden Big Boy jumps up and starts wagging his <laughs> tail because he heard that chopper coming in. I'll leave this slide up and I'll talk a, a, a time when, when Big Boy saved my life and you can understand that you know, I, I got bigger things to worry about than taking pictures, so I don't have any pictures of this. One day Big Boy and I were walking up a, a stream leading a patrol which was a frequent mode of transportation. Vietnam, triple canopy, jungle. Um, when you're walking in the water, you can make a lot better time. And the enemy didn't booby trap the, uh, the water as much as they did on the trails and the land. 
So we're going up this river, and all of a sudden Big Boy stops, and he freezes. And his ears and his eyes are just locked ahead, and there's a huge boulder right alongside that river. And a guy behind me came up and he said, what's the dog reacting to? And I said, humans, probably behind that boulder. We were able to circle and engage the enemy and they had casualties, we had none. There's no doubt in my mind that if a dog had not been leading that patrol and it was another human, we're never gonna smell them. And we would get opposite and we're standing in the middle of this river with no cover at all. I wouldn't be here today, nor would anybody else in that, in that patrol. Estimates are that there'd be 10,000 more names on that wall in Washington, D.C. if it wasn't for the use of dogs. <clears throat> sometimes food was hard to come by for us. No, we, we had sea rations, but sometimes I think the, the insects would have been better eating, but we never shortchanged our dogs. I carried cans of horse meat and then a dry, like a kibbles and bits, and uh, I would, you don't have the luxury in your pack of carrying dog pans and things like this. So what you, what you do, you take your helmet off and I mix the food up and I put it down there. When I've talked at, at schools, I, I, one, one young girl said, oh, that's gross. And I'm saying, one, the longest I was ever out in the field was 21 straight days. 21 straight days with the same set of clothes on 95% humidity, 95 degree temperature. You think it's going to bother me if I take my helmet off and my dog eats out of the helmet and I put it back on my head? No, not a bit. You're with that dog 24 hours a day. It, it, it isn't a piece of equipment to us, even though the, the Army said it was, it was military equipment, not to us it wasn't. It was a living, breathing organism that, that plays with us and sleeps with us and works and saves lives, too. Again, sometimes they, they do more than just lead patrols. When we get to a night position like this, I would walk him around the perimeter so he could understand everything inside is friendly, everything outside we presume is the enemy. And he would stay with me and I would never leash him up because part of his responsibility is to move around so he could smell and detect the enemy at night. Um, and he'd stay with me like this most of the time, except when somebody opened a can of sea rations, and, you know, that, <laughs> and his ears would shoot up and he'd look at me and I'm not feeding him and he'd trot off to this infantry. And it was always fun for me to watch these gruff infantry guys, oh, get out of here, you got your own food. And, and a dog would sit there and you know how your dog is at home with those big brown eyes like, if you don't feed me now, I'm not going to make it till tomorrow. <laughs> and 95% of the time they would feed him. So that was nice. I didn't have to carry as much food. When we got back to the rear, uh, it was break time. And even though this wasn't his, his favorite activity, because this is salt water and he couldn't drink it, I would take him in to the South China Sea. Uh, I was based out of Da Nang. Uh, and it was good. It would get the, te uh, the leeches and the ticks off of him. But yeah, we'd wash those dogs down. We got back from the, from the bush. That was the first order of business, to take care of that dog get him cleaned up, get him brushed out, get him to the vets if he had any cuts or abrasions or anything like that before we'd think about <laughs> taking care of ourselves. And yeah, outside of Da Nang was China Beach, and I know some of you are familiar, well, some of you have probably been to China Beach, but uh, you, you may have seen the TV show, but this is the real China Beach, but what a waste of a nice beach. You got beautiful white sand and beautiful blue water and not a woman in sight. <laughs> and, and all the guys had the same color bathing suits on too, so what a drag. We had uh, little, little uh, mongrel dogs, little pet dogs in our kennel area uh, because our war dogs were not pets. They were, they were a working uh, animal, but we would keep these little mongrel dogs. And it was amazing to see the relationship between the war dogs and these little mongrels. Right after I took this picture, that little puppy picked up the end of the leash, which is the leash right here. This is the only physical uh, remembrance of I, uh, I have of Big Boy. Picked up that leash, and, he, and we'd walk around, and Big Boy would follow this little dog that's pulling him around on the leash. He was so obedient. 
Not all of the enemy had two legs. Some of the enemy had no legs at all. Uh, and I love animals and I love snakes. I'm a wildlife bio biologist by, by academic. Um, but we had so many different venomous snakes in Vietnam that we didn't carry any anti-venom at all. And you know the dog's natural curiosity when they're walking along and they see a snake or something. We work with them a lot and try to keep them away from them, but uh, we lost, we lost a, a number of dogs. This, this is, uh, is not in Vietnam. This is actually a canebrake rattlesnake in, in my training at Fort Gordon, Georgia. They used to kill the snake because they, they would send a, a, a tracker out in the morning and then four hours later they'd bring in a, a, a dog and a handler to follow up the trail and if there was a rattlesnake in the trail they would kill it and I said that's not that's not right you know they have they have an important mission of, of eating rodents and things like that so they said well clag it then you pick them up so they would call me up and I'd come and pick them up which I won't do anymore I don't have the reflexes to do it but I could do that when I was 20. <clears throat> It's always a tough sl slide for me to, to watch here. We had, uh, we had about 10,000 dogs that, uh, I'm sorry, 4,000 dogs that served in Vietnam, 10,000 handlers. 4,000 dogs, 1,000 of them were killed in Vietnam, either direct gunfire, booby traps, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, snake bite, accident, disease. 3,000 of them left at the end of the war. Uh, and unfortunately, they were considered surplus military equipment. Even when I talk about this now, I well up inside because they were not surplus equipment to us. Um, fortunately, the laws changed now. It took another war, it took the Gulf War. And President Clinton signed a bill that, that says no military working dog left behind. They come home. But those 3,000 dogs, they were either sent to the South Vietnamese who never worked with us, didn't know how to use them, and I won't get into cultural things of what happens to dogs in the Orient, but m many of us, given those two terrible choices, probably would have preferred euthanization to send them to South Vietnamese. But when we had a dog that was killed, didn't matter what time of the night that dog was brought back in, we had a service for that dog. And again, we weren't given resources for the cemetery, but you better believe we came up with them and, uh, and honored the dog. This was the headstone of our 48 scout dog and you can see the dog's name, the four-digit ear tattoo number that all the dogs were given, uh, the date the dog was killed and the unit the dog was killed with. And you can see we were losing about a dog a month. Lost too many handlers too. I, I served with, uh, trained with 24 guys at Fort Gordon, Georgia uh, and uh, at least two of those were killed. Uh, and some of them, I don't know what happened to them. I'm not in contact with everybody. Uh, Sergeant Hartsock and Duke was the only uh, Medal of Honor recipient uh, dog handler, and he was leading a patrol with Duke, uh, and they were out in the open, and Duke alerted on a human ambush, and uh, there was no cover around them, and the enemy started firing. Sergeant Hartsock uh, fired back, even though he and Duke were both hit but they engaged in the in the firefight long enough that they can get aerial support and saved everybody else. Sergeant Hodsock was was killed and given posthumously the Medal of Honor. Uh, this was another scout dog handler, uh, Robert Nagel. He survived Vietnam just fine but he became a police canine officer and, and happened to be in the World Trade Center in the 9-11 attack and he was killed. We had a reunion uh, of our Vietnam Dog Handler Association in the year 2000. We went back to Washington, D.C., and you can see uh, the base of the Vietnam Wall there, uh, the mementos that, that the, the handlers had left. This is very appropriate that he comes up at this time because we honored the dogs that didn't come home and the handlers that didn't come home. I didn't know who this dog was or its, its handler that was killed, but it's pretty safe to assume this little baby never saw his real father. Happy and a sad day for me. This is a day I got out of Vietnam, certainly happy, but sad because our dogs didn't have that, that option. And, and right after this picture was taken, 
uh, I watched Big Boy get carted up on a, a, a truck and sent to the South Vietnamese. And I will carry to my grave the look that that dog gave me of where am I going and how come you're not going with me. And that's one of the reasons I like to talk about what these dogs did. Moving on to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and initially, the only dogs that were used in, in the Iraq war and Gulf war as well was sentry dogs. But then they started to realize that the enemy is using pagers and cell phones to electronically detonate explosives. And they started bringing in mine detection dogs. Uh, and, and they have a tremendous use of them. I mentioned Vietnam, just German Shepherds Labs, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, all the other places that dogs are serving. It's labs again, German Shepherds again, and Belgian Malinois. Belgian Malinois, and I never heard of this breed in Vietnam, but they're using them now, and I've talked to the handlers today, and they said the Belgians are a little smaller than German Shepherds, and, and they seem to be quicker in picking up uh, training. Uh, and so they're using them. Incidentally, this is my son that's kneeled down. Um, he's a Black Hawk helicopter pilot. And when his first tour in Iraq, um, he came upon this Belgian Malinois and the handler and thought that I would appreciate the, the picture of that team. Uh, he's, he's been deployed three or four times now. He's going to Kosovo in December. And that, that's something there. In Vietnam, we knew we were there for a year. Then we're going home. Now, even though they're volunteers, they got multiple deployments. And that is really tough on a family. He just got married last month. And in, uh, in December, he's going to Kosovo for a year. So kind of tough. Um, you see the dogs are fitted, fitted with flak jackets because a lot of the dogs uh, were killed because of chest wounds. And in Vietnam, they didn't use them probably because they made the decision they weren't coming home anyway, but I'm so glad they're using them now. And they're so sophisticated that some of them have cameras mounted on the, on the uh, flak jacket, and the handler doesn't even have to go into the house. He can, he can turn the camera and there's also a microphone on, on the flak jacket, and he can direct the dog with commands so the dog can walk into the building and turn which way the handler wants to, and he can move his camera around and see what the dog is seeing. And so saving a lot of handler lives now. This is these uh, two bomb detection dogs, and this is the... the the cache that they, they founded one day, and you can imagine the death and devastation if these, uh, these bombs were in the wrong hands. Again, you've got the lab and you've got the German Shepherd there. And they got women handlers now. In Vietnam, we didn't have any, any women handlers, which it's kind of ludicrous. A dog is going to listen to a woman uh, as much as a man. But uh, I'm glad to see. I, I think it, probably more of, of the logistics in Vietnam you're out in the field. You're out in the field for a week or a couple weeks at a time. Having females there might be a little bit awkward. Now, when the infantry goes out, they go out for the day and then they come back. So it makes a lot more sense. And you can teach these dogs to do amazing things like fly these black hawks. Now, this was always fun because the, the handlers would set their dogs up in these scenarios. And, because again, they weren't equipment to us. They they were pets, and we had we had a good time with them. And yeah, they're they're they'll, they're patient. They'll wait. But again, that bond, that loyalty that between that dog and the handler, it's a bond that's never broken. This uh, video was put together, narrated by Martin Sheen, talks about um, the contribution of the dogs in Vietnam to bring some exposure to them. Uh, this is a state dog memorial. This is one in Riverside, California. Uh, and it's depicting the dog leading the handler from, from death into life. Here's one in New Jersey. Uh, this is no longer, this, this originally was going to be our National War Dog Memorial. We've changed the design on that. Uh, but it's depict, depicting dogs from all, all wars. Um, and it's down in San Antonio now. I went before the Colorado House and Senate 
to get a resolution of support from Colorado uh, to, to support the, the creation of a National War Dog Memorial, which was a no-brainer. We weren't asking for money because it wasn't going to be built in Colorado. It was going to be built initially in Washington, D.C., but we couldn't get permission from the Park Service to have it uh, on the mall there. So we moved it to San Antonio, which makes sense because Lackland Air Force Base is a repository for all the dogs coming into the service. And there's a big vet hospital at Lackland that dogs that are wounded overseas and can be flown back and treated, they're treated in Lackland. So it's important that, that it be there. Uh, I spoke on the, at the Capitol steps and I had uh, dog teams from Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs and Buckley Air Force Base in Aurora to come out and support. Uh, little did I know that, and I didn't know this woman, uh, Sergeant Dana and her dog Rex. Um, I took a picture of her as I did with all of them. Three months after this picture was taken, Sergeant Dana was over in, in Iraq and the Humvee hit uh, a booby trap and flipped three times and she and Rex were very, very seriously wounded. Uh, they thought that she may not survive. She did, fortunately. Rex survived and, and uh, uh, he was ready to go back into service. Sergeant Dana's wounds were so severe she could never serve in the Air Force again, but they were going to give Rex to another handler. And I, I could see both sides of that. Very expensive to train these dogs. I've heard anywhere $40,000 to $100,000. Cairo, the dog that was sent over on the mission of Osama bin Laden, was the most uh, expensive dog that we've ever had as far as the training. These dogs are in their prime, and it makes sense to switch them to another handler. But I think in this instance, uh, President uh, Bush and First Lady Laura Bush made the decision to turn Rex over to Sergeant Dana, and they lived, at least Rex lived the rest of his life in Pennsylvania. Is that yes. the basis of a movie that came out? There was a movie about a uh, female dog handler. Yes, Seems yes. Right? Yep, okay. yep. Uh, this is the last slide here, um, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll stop here. Hopefully we have time for questions, but um, yeah, it's not a piece of equipment to us. We, we just, these dogs meant the world to us, and, and I, I've had dogs, and I get this asked all the time when, when I give talks, particularly at schools. They say, Rick, do you have dogs now? And I said, yeah, I, I, I'm working on my, my third lab, and then I said, my wife went out clothes shopping at a mall with a girlfriend of hers, and there was a little cage with a little Shih Tzu in it. And she brought this little Shih Tzu back, this little fuzzy, yappy dog, and I said, I'm not going to walk this dog. I don't want my neighbors to see me. And it is the most personable dog, so I have changed my tune on small dogs. They, they do have a purpose in life. So. I think I will end there. Um, hopefully uh, there's some questions and, and uh, I'll be available afterwards. And, and if anybody's interested in a book, I'd be happy to sign them. Did the uh, VC or the NVA use dogs? Good question. The VC or the NVA? No, they didn't. But they do now. My wife and I visited Vietnam uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, they wouldn't let us go to this dog facility there. But they have German Shepherds now. I think they realized how important these dogs were in war. Um, I will mention one thing in, in conjunction with my trip to Vietnam. How many of you have been to Vietnam outside of the war? Anybody? Yeah, you guys have, Pat and Wanda. Uh, beautiful country, and, and I certainly knew that from my time in Vietnam. Unfortunately, one of our legacies is, is Agent Orange. Uh, it's affecting us. There are many of us that are on disability now, not necessarily from physical wounds sustained in Vietnam, but just the absorption of that carcinogen into our system. And it might take 50 years, but a lot of us are starting to develop the symptoms from Agent Orange, and unfortunately it's in the indigenous Vietnamese population too. We visited hospitals there where the kids are still in wheelchairs and will be the rest of their life because They've absorbed that in their system by 
eating the, the crops and the fish and things that that, that uh, carcinogen gets into. So unfortunately, that's one of our legacies in Vietnam, and it's going to be another 50 years before that dissipates enough where it's not going to be affecting the, uh, the population over there. So it's a shame. And, you know, we were treated very well in Vietnam, and most of the Vietnamese are too young to remember when the Americans were there. Um, we visited a museum in Saigon, well, Ho Chi Minh City now, but Saigon to us, it served there. And uh, it talks about the uh, American war and the American atrocities. So, you know, it's kind of tough for us to, to handle that, but it is a beautiful country. Anybody that has an opportunity to go there, I would recommend they do so. Yes? When a dog is wounded and brought back to San Antonio to Lackland, does the trainer come along? Uh, it depends. It depends on the severity of the wounds of the dog. Uh, if it's going to be a short term, they might leave the, the handler back wherever the dog was wounded. But if it's long term, they might bring him back because he's going to have to work on recovery for these dogs. And sometimes they would bring them back knowing that they're never going to serve in the military again, but at least they wanted to get them well enough to be adopted. And, and most of the dogs uh, are adoptable, and most of the dogs are adopted by their last handler because that dog meant more to them than, than it would to anybody else. Yes? Did you have veterinarian training? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I, could, I could do very minor things. I couldn't sew up cuts or abrasions or anything like that. Um, if the dog was, was wounded enough, We'd, we'd get them out of the field right away, and we'd take them back to the vets. Uh, I can't say enough about the vets in Vietnam because they, they worked under really tough conditions. Um, I mean, it's tough being a vet anyway, uh, I think more so than a, than a human medical doctor because the dog can't necessarily tell what's wrong. Uh, but I think the toughest thing for being a vet in Vietnam was the ones that had to administer that shot at the end to a perfectly healthy dog and, and end that dog's life. And I've talked to some vets since I've been back here that served in Vietnam, and they said, yeah, toughest thing I've ever done in my life. But they would, didn't matter what time we, we brought a dog team back, could be in the middle of the night, the vets and the vet techs would be up and, and working on that dog. They wouldn't wait till the next morning. Yes? Did they have any protection for their paws? Uh, no, they didn't. Um, they do now uh, in areas, if they're going to be going into rubble and cement and, you know, where they've got an opportunity to cut pads, like the World Trade Center, they, they put booties on the dogs there, uh, which they really needed to do because there's so many sharp corners and things that the dogs would, would cut their pads on. And, uh, usually they can recover fairly quickly, but if deep enough, it might leave the dog out for a couple of weeks, and you know you're, you're wasting a, a resource there. But no, we didn't have we didn't have pads on our dogs. Can I ask another one? Yeah. I've heard that the dogs have a rank higher than their handlers. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. In Vietnam, <laughs> we didn't have that at all. That we had no rank for the dogs, but now the dog is one rank higher than the handler. Yeah. Now of course they don't they don't get any pay, but <laughs> yeah. Are military dogs used uh, in crossover to civilian cases if they're needed? Um probably more the other way than than it would be going over to civilian, but <clears throat> for example when uh, the Oklahoma City bombing occurred in the Murray building and of course that was, there was a, a Montessori in that building with children and uh, it collapsed right away. They brought in military dogs in there because they were trained and they could, they could uh, smell them in the rubble there. So yeah, there are instances where they've used them. Certainly in the World Trade Center there was such a demand uh, far more than, than the civilian dogs could handle. They brought in military dogs for that. Unfortunately, with the World Trade Center, uh, they brought in search and rescue dogs that their job is to smell out people. Well, there wasn't any people to be found in that rubble. So they quickly replaced 
uh, these search and rescue dogs with cadaver dogs. That, and that was their job was to find very faint remains of humans and they were at least able to bring closure to a lot of families that lost loved ones in, in the 9-11 attack. Yeah? I've heard that uh, during Vietnam that the French poodle, standard size poodle, was, could have been a popular dog in Vietnam, but there wasn't enough donated yeah, I never heard that. I never heard that. I never saw a, a poodle. I never saw a poodle there. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I, somebody mentioned that to me one time that that they thought that that they used poodles. Now they might have in in other areas, but I never saw them in Vietnam. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, and again, I have books up here. If anybody is interested, I'd, I'd uh, be happy to show you a book. And again, all proceeds go to uh, Lackland. Thank you. Just one, one quick thing before we go off our separate.